Okay, hi everyone. Uh, hopefully I have resolved the audio issues I was seeing at the start of the last stream. Uh, if, if there's anyone in the chat wants to say hi. Oh, hi, Dylan Beatty is in the chat room. Good to, good to see you. And yeah, Steve also confirms he can hear me. That's great. Uh, well, thank you for, for joining me. I'm uh, going to have a second stab at live streaming. Uh, yesterday was my first go, which I went pretty well. I had hoped to do a little more in the time, um, but hopefully we can kind of pick up from where I left off yesterday. Uh, so to kind of recap what I'm planning to do and, and what we've, we've been doing so far is uh, I'm basically looking at comparing and benchmarking JSON deserialization. Um, so what we did yesterday is, if I jump over to the code, let's, let's see where we got to yesterday. Uh, so we produced uh, this yesterday, which is uh, using uh, benchmark.net um, to, to run a number of benchmarks. And what we're basically doing is saying, this is our you know, input JSON um, that we're gonna be deserializing from. Um, and then in each of our benchmark methods here, uh, we're, we're doing deserialization using uh, different libraries. So Newtonsoft JSON, uh, UTF-8 JSON, System Text JSON. So these are the kind of free ones we're, we're looking at. Um, and what we're basically deserializing into is this, um, this uh, cluster health response type here. So the, the context for this is that uh, in Elasticsearch.net and the Nest client libraries for Elasticsearch, um, you know, at the moment we do a lot of deserialization and, and also serialization and ready for the next kind of major release, I'd like to look at, you know, are there any optimizations we can make um, to make that library even faster for consumers without anyone having to do anything. So you just upgrade to say version eight. Um, and as a result, you know, the serialization behind the scenes is going to be a little bit quicker um, and allocate less, which if you're doing kind of high throughput type of work, uh, which I have done in the past, um, will all add up uh, for you as a consumer. So that's kind of the goal. Um, so this is this is the code that we've kind of got so far um, and we can run these benchmarks. Um, I've got the results um, that we got to yesterday basically. So this is benchmark.net's output um, and we can see for each of our different benchmarks, uh, mean execution time uh, in microseconds here. So we can see UTF-8 JSON slightly quicker than the, the new system text JSON from Microsoft, um, but it does allocate a little bit more. I mean, we are talking only a few sort of hundreds of bytes here. Um, so not a huge amount, but uh, it all adds up. Uh, Newtonsoft JSON, uh, a little bit slower, significantly higher allocations. Um, so, you know, just for deserializing that one type, we've got quite a lot of allocations. Um, and uh, a discussion actually just went on on, on Twitter. Um, Jeremy Miller raised, you know, a really good point that Newtonsoft JSON is a really good library. It's been around for a long time. It's battle tested. It handles a lot of weird quirks in JSON and and slightly illegal JSON quite well. Um, and so it's a really good library for those kind of needs where you just want to guarantee without having to do too much heavy lifting in your code with attributes um, and things like that. It just handles stuff and it can deserialize, you know, into internal uh, setters and stuff. It, it seems to work pretty well. Um, System text JSON is newer and is still kind of getting features added. Um, so Microsoft have kind of added a bit more in five. There's still work to do to kind of close close some gaps with Newtonsoft JSON. I don't think they're ever gonna total have total parity. Uh, there's no real need um, from, from their perspective of what they're doing. Uh, they're looking for sort of strict JSON serialization, deserialization, uh, and and you know for for things like ASP.NET and stuff like that. But I think it's still has got a way to go before everyone can use it um, without having to kind of tweak their code maybe. Um, so that's where we got to in benchmarking. Um, the other thing we've done on here as well in this solution uh, is we've added some tests, and these all these do is execute our benchmark methods and validate that uh, indeed we've deserialized what we expected to deserialize. So just as a kind of belt and braces that uh, as particularly as we go into today's stream where I'm going to start thinking about um, writing my own JSON uh, reader, uh, which will kind of try and optimize away some of those extra allocations, and maybe get a bit quicker than system text JSON's kind of native uh, deserializer. Um, but using the underlying low-level client, uh, sorry, the low-level libraries that um, System Text JSON brings. So there's a UTF-8 JSON reader 
library uh, type. Sorry, I keep saying library. Uh, it's been a long day for me. Uh, there's a there's a, a reader type that we can use that allows us to basically access the JSON tokens um, um, from uh, the stream of JSON as we're reading it. And I want to see if I can kind of build a custom reader that's very much shaped for our particular model that we've got, our object that we're trying to deserialize into. Um, because this is something we could potentially auto-generate. Uh, this is not code, I'm not expecting this to be code that we would do for every type in the system manually because it would just be too much work. Um, but could we do something where we could co-gen this uh, kind of stuff? So hopefully that's kind of clear. So the objective today is is to really start with a custom, uh, custom deserializing. Uh, so before we do anything else, let's add a new benchmark uh, method for, for doing this. Um, I'm going to make it async for now because I'm going to assume it is um, going to need it, but we'll see. Uh, we can always change that in a moment. So this is our kind of empty method. It's not doing anything at the moment. Um, and let's think about how we want to start this. So basically on, so if I grab this namespace, let's just um, so there's a UTF-8 JSON reader here, and this is the this, the sort of low-level high-performance API. And as it says, it's for read-only access to UTF-8 JSON um, or UTF-8 encoded JSON text. So um, we're going to use that um, in our code. Um, so what I'm thinking I'm going to do, let's just let's create it down here. Uh, let's create a, a struct now. I'm not convinced if I'm going to need this at the moment, but what I want to do is again, I'm, I'm, the whole goal of this is to avoid heap allocations. So um, creating a class here that we then have to instantiate is going to add a heap allocation for the new type. And I'm 90% I'm sure that then we're going to lose any gains that we might make. So instead what I'm going to do is pretty much like UTF-8 JSON reader itself, which is a struct. I'm going to use that um, to hopefully try and avoid that allocation. I'm just going to top up on coffee throughout this as well because uh, I did some uh, Elastic Engineer 2 training this morning for four or five hours and uh, it's kind of warped my brain a bit um, to bear with me. So this reader, let's call this uh, Cluster Health Response Reader. Um, and why are we unhappy about this? Okay, uh, well, it doesn't really matter if it's public with the namespace in my way. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, so, we're going to have, I'm going to have a constructor on this thing, uh, which I'm going to accept a stream in, and then we'll store that stream in a field. Uh, yeah, create that read only field for that. Um, what else are we going to need? Let's start with that for now. Um, and then on here, let's have a method that's going to return a cluster health response. And I'll just call this read. Um, now, arguably, this method could accept the stream and we could work off of that. But um, the UTF-8 JSON reader is as you will see in a moment, um, is this kind of it's got this re-entry concept. Um, so you don't necessarily, when you're using it, have all of the data. You know, you don't have the full uh, JSON object uh, necessarily read uh, in at the time you start parsing through it. Um, and so it has this concept of state that it maintains uh, on each call. And I'm pretty sure, you know, at the moment we're working in our tests with a memory stream, so all of the data is kind of pre-buffered. But realistically, this would be used against uh, HTTP client responses. So that's my kind of objective here is just to um, kind of assume that we might have some state that we're going to be carrying around in this in this type as we as we manage it. So let's let's go with this at the moment. Um, and now we're going to need to read from our stream. So to read from streams, um, we need a, a buffer, a byte buffer in this case. Um, I don't want to be doing allocations, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create uh, a buffer, but I'm going to use the uh, the array pool feature of C sharp, uh, well, or a .net I should say. Uh, it's not an I array pool; that's the one I want. Um, it's an array pool of bytes um, that we're going to want. We're going to access the shared array pool, um, and then we're going to rent 
an array. Uh, it wants a minimum length. It might not. It might give us an array that's bigger than this. Um, doesn't really matter. I'm going to just do uh, about 4K for now. Um, we could we could do some analysis of the you know the average response sizes and and kind of how much we might need to do, um, but let's assume that we're going to try and read into into that for now. Um, now, anytime we've rented an array, we need to make sure we return it. So I'm going to do a, a try finally here. Uh, so at the end of all of this, uh, regardless of whether we succeeded or not. Um, uh, array pool of bytes dot shared uh, return and then we just return back our buffer so that makes sure that when we're done with it uh, we're gonna we're gonna give that back because the whole idea of pooling these is that you know we're gonna re reuse these buffers um, we might reuse them or because we're using you know a byte uh, there's framework features and, and .NET features that might also be renting um, from the array pool as well so we might be getting uh, arrays that they've also you know created in that pool and, and brought back so this isn't, if this is the very first time this is run, this isn't necessarily guaranteed, guaranteed to be zero allocations for a single run. Um, but over time, the kind of cost is amortized across uh, the, the reuse. Uh, so now I need to remember how to do a nice loop around um, an array. So I'm going to do last red bytes, I think. Um, and then we're going to do a while. And then I think I can assign uh, last red bytes is going to equal um, stream dot read. Uh, do we want to read from async? Realistically, we probably would read from async. I'm going to do read for now because it just saves some complexity. But um, probably realistically, when we're reading off of um, something that might not be fully buffered, we might want to use the async version here. So we're going to need to give it the buffer. Um, we want to give it uh, the offset, so we're going to read um, offset zero to the length of the data. So that's whatever's in the um, in the stream length. No, let me think about this. Um, it's going to be maximum, I suppose, of up to the buffer uh, buffer length in here. I'm going to say when that's greater than zero uh, loop. I think that's right. So that should give us back how many bytes have been read on this particular occasion, which may or not may not be complete. Um, and then what we can say is um, if that lost hmm, actually. So at some point we're going to need to allocate this cluster health response thing. Um, I guess it's possible. Uh, that the stream has zero bytes for some reason. So I could allocate this at the start of the method, but maybe we don't don't have that. So let's let's have one, but uh, let's set it to null here. We will return it from here. Uh, and then let's assign it here. So let's say if the last red bytes greater than zero um, and the existing response up there is null because uh, we only want to allocate this once um, within here. Uh, if that's true, then uh, response can equal a new cluster health response. So we've got, because we're going to need to, we can create this empty instance for now and then we're going to just set the properties on it is my goal. I've got, I've got some wacky ideas about how this might work uh, kind of rolling around and I did kind of prototype something a little while back so I'm trying to to think back to to the structure I ended up with but so in this while loop we're going to want to uh, process the data. Um, so in this case we're going to get all the data back in one go but realistically we may not so let's add private method on here uh, called process uh, oh, sorry it's, uh, it's going to be void returning I think for now or are we going to need an, a task let's try this uh, so we're going to take we're going to process um, the data which is going to come from our buffer but I want to take it in a I'm going to 
I'm going to take it in as a read-only span here, so um, we should be able to slice this because we're going to have a buffer here that's 4K. The stream could be a lot less and will be in this scenario a lot less. So we're not going to return the whole buffer. We're going to return the, the part of the buffer that contains data that we've read. So I'm going to need to to take that in, we'll call that data, I guess, um, which means that we'll probably need the last red byte counts and that, so that we know how big it is. But can we do this differently? Yeah, we could slice before we send it in, actually. So I'm planning to just take in a cluster health response, which will be the thing that we're going to populate. Um, and I might need to make this re-entrant to support the UTF-8 JSON reader in a moment, but let's think about that when we get there. So we're going to take in some data and we're going to parse that data and try and produce some kind of response. Um, let's think. So what we would do up here then, so we've got some, we've got a number of bytes read off the stream in our buffer, hopefully. So we can call process here. We're going to pass in um, the buffer but we're going to call that as span on that, and then we'll call um, slice, slicing from position zero to the last red bytes count. So this is like how many bytes we've actually read off the thing, um, and then we can pass in our response there. That feels reasonable. And then in here we're going to do the heavy lifting of actually parsing this thing out. Um, if there's any questions on what I'm trying to do or my approach, feel free to, to drop them in the chat. Or if you think there's a better way of doing stuff, let me know. Um, let's go with that for now. So this is the stub of our thing. I think this is just because it's unused, yeah. So let's, in our um, in our actual benchmark here, I know this isn't actually gonna do anything right now. Let's imagine that we're gonna use this uh, thing. So I'm gonna reposition my stream as, as part of my requirements each time. I'm reusing the same stream uh, in each benchmark uh, run. Um, we're going to need an instance then of this cluster response reader because it's again a struct. We're not going to need to allocate that. So let's have the uh, the reader here equals a new uh, new one of those, and it's going to take in our stream, and then uh, the cluster health response that we're setting can then hopefully be just reader dot read, uh, which should work, and then. That's while we're here, let's put a test in around this concept as well. So obviously it's, it's kind of gonna fail, but um, custom reader test, uh, we don't need to do too much on here. So we do sup.setup. Um, I made my method async, but I'm wondering maybe we don't now. Uh, yeah, it would only need to be async if I decided to read asynchronously off this stream, I think, um, which I'm not gonna do just for my own simplicity right now. So. Let's, let's make this void returning. Uh, there. We'll call custom. Uh, no, custom. What's my method called? Custom reader benchmark. That's what I'm looking for, isn't it? Yeah. I was being, being dense. Oh, it's the await. Okay. Just got rid of the thing that's confusing me. Right. So this now uh, is also going to be void. A uh, storm is kicking off out there tonight. Um, and that's going to assert on the response. So I guess, you know, we could do some TDD here, I suppose, and we'll just run this to prove that we get a massively failing test. Cool. So yeah, so it's it's got an instance of cluster health response, which is kind of interesting, actually. Uh, oh, no, that's correct. So yeah, I think that, that proves this logic here is working. Um, Sorry, this logic here is working. So we're, we're allocating this um, because we know that we've got bytes, but we haven't actually read any of the data into the thing. Um, so now this is where things are going to get weird. So the, the, the concepts I've got in my head for how this might work, and, and this is not necessarily going to be a production ready concept yet, but because we're considering that we'd be able to auto generate this, I can do some kind of I can make some assumptions. And the first assumption let's make is that uh, Elasticsearch in this response gives us these properties in the same order, which may or may not be a, a very safe assumption, but I'm, I'm, I'm moderately confident at the moment it, it's okay for this at least. 
Um, so if I contrast that, um, then I can I can read uh, the JSON tokens from this, knowing the particular order they're going to come out in. So uh, in the case of a token, what we're talking about is this is a start uh, object token in the kind of concept of JSON reader. Uh, this will be a property name token, I think. This will be a string token. This would be a string as well. This would be a, uh, a bool token. I, I don't know if there's a special type for that. Num numeric tokens. So there's, there's a token here, there's a token here, there's a token here, etc. So what I could say on this JSON is what I'm thinking is we can ignore all of these because we don't, if we assume the order's correct, we, we can assume just by the position of the token uh, where we're going to, where we're going to actually which property we're writing it into on our, our type. So I'm going to say anything that's, uh, so th say this is token one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. Any even number token in this list, I'm just going to kind of ignore. I'm just going to validate that there is a token, but I'm not going to check the name or the value of it um, is what I'm thinking. And then for most of these, they're numeric and they're going to integers. So we might be able to have some kind of group rule on those. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what I'm thinking. So we're going to kind of number the tokens as we go through, um, which means I think what I'm going to want is, uh, I'm going to want in my code here to have a token counter, I guess, because we're going to, we're going to increment this, um, as we go through, we allocate that there, assign that there. Uh, so we have a token counter, which will increment as we, as we read tokens out, um, I'll do for now. So, what are we going to do? We're going to we're going to want to um, we're going to want a JSON reader. So var reader uh, equals new UTF eight JSON reader. Now, this is what I mean about it being re-entrant. I know this might be quite small on the seven twenty p. So it's going to take the the data, it's a read-only span or a read-only sequence. Um, it's then also going to ask if um, if we're on the final block, which means have we are we now on the, the final block of data that represents the full complete JSON and the state. I'm going to need to maintain this state, I think, because again, as, as the moment we have everything in memory, but we may not guarantee that when we're doing this in, in real. So I'm going to oh, stick the state up here, I think. Um, let's have it here. So let's have um, JSON read uh, state. Um, and this will be uh, that name like that. Um, we'll assign that down here. Uh, so that's just going to be a new JSON reader state. That's annoying. So it wants options. Uh, what are JSON reader options? What is it? Okay, so that's that's also a struct. It makes sense because again, the, the you know they're trying to avoid allocations in here. Uh, in that case, I can probably just get away with passing in the default. So I don't have any options. I don't think that I'm caring about, but we may do. So we have the state. Yeah. So we are going to need to know. We're going to need to know here as well. Is last block um, and we'll, we'll use that to pass in here and then up here we'll have to figure that out somehow so YouTube 8 JSON reader uh, so it's going to take our data it's going to take that is last block and then it's going to take the JSON reader state off of off of here that may or may not be a decision that comes to bite me um, but we'll give that a whirl um, so up here how are we going to know if we're on the last block we're going to have to keep track, um, so var uh, total bytes red, it's gonna just be a, a value here. And then I guess if we update that here with whatever we've just read, so assuming we've read, you know, say this stream is 500 bytes long, but we've only got 50, we'll, we'll say, okay, well, we've read 50. Um, and then I guess here we can compare that against the stream link. So total bytes, um, yeah, if that equals the stream dot length, we've read everything on the stream. I think that makes sense. I'm always a bit fuzzy on, on I, I use streams, but 
not enough to know the, all of the details about some of these things. So yeah, I think this will work for the memory stream, whether it will work on a, a HP content stream later on could be another matter. Let's just check my uh, chat over here as well and make sure that's up on screen. Cool. Uh, okay, nothing new over there. So I'm, I'm keeping an eye on, on multiple screens again. So we're, we're looping over, we're reading bytes from the stream, we're allocating them into our buffer that's been rented. We are going to then try and process whatever bytes we've managed to grab in our process method. So yeah, we, we're kind of happy in again here. So, um, so now we're gonna read. Uh, so I know that there's a read method on the reader. Uh, yeah, it returns a ball. So this basically should return false, I think, if there's no further JSON tokens to read. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. I think internally the JSON reader state will keep track of where it is in the object that we're reading through. So. Um, Okay, so we've got a token count. So if we just rethink about how this works. Uh, okay, so our token count starts at zero. So this is actually token zero. Um, and then how many we've we got here? Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30. That's nice, nice round number. So we've got 30 tokens in here, which is the name and then the value. We've got this, so that's 32 tokens in total for this object, um, starting at zero. So this is zero, this is 31. And then if that case, all of the odd numbers are, are property names, all even numbers are values. Someone keep track of that for me because I may may forget. Oh, hey, Stuart's, Stuart's joined. Welcome to Stuart. Uh, I think probably the last time we saw each other in person was at a DDD event, um, which obviously uh, a long distant thing with COVID at the moment, uh, in-person events we are kind of, I think, speakers attendees alike are all a bit desperate to kind of get out and go to an actual event or conference or user group um the online ones are fun but they're just not quite the same uh so we are reading through i know i shouldn't have answered or responded just there so what did i say token zero is the start 31 is the end odd numbers are uh tokens that mirror up some property names so evens are our values i think so we can say if uh, our token counter uh, is zero, then we know we should be on the start object. So we'll do another, I'm not entirely sure what I want to do in these scenarios, but let's say that we want to throw on this basis. So if this is not a start object, um, so if the reader dot uh, token type at this point is not equal to, uh, a start object, then something's gone wrong, and we'll just throw a new. Uh, let's just, just throw a random exception here, and then we'll think about what that should be. It should probably be a JSON. Actually, is there a JSON exception? Yeah, we we'll use that. Uh, so we'll obviously, I want some method. Uh, no, it's not. It's just it's the, because we've got so many uh, serializers in this this project together. Uh, it's kind of making the world a bit complex. So we'll throw that. We'd throw a nice message here, probably. So if, if token zero isn't that, then something's gone wrong. I guess what we should remember to do at the end of this while loop before I forget is I should increment my token counter because we will read a token at a time um, off of here. Uh, so let's say else if uh, token counter modulus two is um, not equal to zero, I always forget how these work. Modulus two, yeah, so if we no remainder of that, then we've got uh, an odd number, which means we should be in a, uh, we can do another check. We can basically repeat this check here, but we will check that we've got a property token or, or whatever it's called, uh, property name, property name. So in our odd tokens, we'll assume they should be a property name. And then I think this is where it's gonna get a little messy because what we're gonna do, this is what I'm thinking, uh, is now we're, we're in a position where we're actually gonna assign values to stuff. So, um, what are you gonna do? We're gonna need to do these in the order. I'm just gonna, for my own purposes on a second monitor, I'm just gonna um, slap this into uh, Notepad++ over here. Uh, just so I can reference the, the actual order of these. Again, we're making this assumption that the order is is correct. So what I'm gonna say 
is, uh, well, let's bring this over. So token zero, token one. So if on token two, we should be able to get the string value and assign it. And I'm not sure how easy that's gonna be. Uh, it might be okay. So let's say, uh, let's do a switch, I think. A switch statement here feels reasonable because we're gonna basically have to have a condition for each of the tokens we care about. So switch on the token counter. And then let's say case um, zero, one, two. Um, case two, we'll do something. So in here, we'll say um, reader dot, um, I suppose we, should, we could check I was gonna say we could check if it's a string, but do we need to? Because we'll probably just throw if it can't get a string. Let's assume for a minute. Um, I'm not too sure what the internals do. So let's check if this is a string. If it's not, we're gonna throw. Otherwise, we can say that on our response that we've passed in so we've got our instance here that we're actually building up we know this is going to be the cluster name and then that should be reader dot get oops reader dot get uh get string cool so this is a method that basically takes internally takes whatever bytes it's got that it knows is a token and it's going to give us the the string value uh, the, of that so we can then use it so i can assign that over there uh, cool. I realize we're like 10 minutes, I think, if I've done my times correctly, we're 10 minutes from the inauguration of the next president. So uh, I can understand if people may be more interested in watching watching that than me. Um, but otherwise, I'm going to kind of carry on. I want to see if I can get to a point where this compiles, can test, and maybe we can benchmark it before I kind of quit. Um, already, though, what, 50 minutes in? It's crazy. Um, so the next interesting thing then is going to be um the 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 bool value so i'll bring this back over here so the next one is it's a string here um but what we want to do is actually turn this into a bool or uh, sorry an enum it's an enum um so i'm going to do a trick um and i knew i knew i was going to be probably doing this so I'm, i've actually got i've got the code prepared because i uh, i didn't want to type this live um and i'll I'll explain what this does in a moment um, and hopefully this is right but uh, in my reader here um, I'm going to add some wacky looking code um, and I've got the article that references this as well which people might be interested in so read only span and static data so um, I'll put this link into the chat actually People want to follow along, but the, the basic thing is, we can we can use a compiler optimization um, with read-only span that avoids an additional mem copy. Um, this explains a bit about what's going on. You don't need to really understand the the details, but it's just about where the the static data that we're storing for this byte array actually gets stored and how that then ends up being um, represented to us as our, our read-only span. So what I'm saying here, what I'm doing is defining the bytes uh, of the word yellow, uh, but doing it character by character in this um, this array. So it's an array of bytes. It's going to be six bytes long. Um, the byte for Y, the byte for E, etc. Uh, same for green, same for red. So that's what I've pre-prepared because I knew I'd, I'd be doing a lot of yucky copy paste for this and I'd probably mess it up. So these are going to be our comparison spans. Um, and then what we can do, because what I could do is I could read the string so let's explain why I'm thinking of doing it this way. Um, I could read the string value and then I could just say, well, if it's if string equals equals yellow, then use this enum value. Um, but the, the thing I want to do here is not over allocate and allocating a string that I'm throwing away feels feels mucky. And I know there is a way of reading um, slightly differently on the reader um, to actually read the, the bytes and then I can compare the bytes. So let's let's just do this and then it might make a bit more sense. So let's, Case four. So what we're going to say is, um, uh, so we need to access the span from the the UTF-8 JSON reader, which is also a bit mucky. Um, I read the docs on this earlier. Um, so let's call this working span. 
uh, because the reader has this thing where I can get the value span. Um, it says, gets the raw value of the last process token as a read-only span of bytes sliced, uh, or a read-only span of bytes slice of the input payload. If the token fits into a single segment or the reader was constructed with a payload that only contained a read-only span. Now I think in our case that's true because we are constructing this with a read-only span. Um, the reason it might not be a span in other cases is if you are reading data, so system IO pipelines, for example, does this, it returns you back as um, sequence um, and you need or a read-only sequence and then you need to it's it could be one or more uh, it's basically a linked list of, of sort of buffers really I mean it could be one or more of those so you can't just get an individual buffer from it it's a bit of a pain so in the docs they say what you have to do is say okay does this have a value sequence and then if so we'll use the the, the, the readers value sequence or the value span I think that's right uh, no that's the wrong that's the opposite one I do that's the uh, the final so we, if it's a sequence then we need to do some other clever stuff. I'm I'm gonna cheat here, and what I'll just do is um, for now, because this needs to, this all need to be fixed. But I don't really want to get into um, how we actually read this. So I'm just gonna cheat here. As, uh, let's put in a comment. This is not necessarily uh, valid, and I can't spell. Uh, typo. Yes. I love I love spell checking the uh, jet brains. Uh, right, so we're we're saying this isn't totally valid. For, we'll cheat for now, um, and basically we're going to get the the byte span that represents what the token value is, and then I should be able to say well if the working span uh, is um, what do I want to say? I want to say uh, sequence equal, don't I? Sequence equal to uh, the, so let's go with the yellow span. I think that's the one I defined first. So if the working sequence span of bytes is, is exactly equal to the the, uh, the yellow span, then we know that we're on uh, we know that we're on a yellow value. So now I can set my response dot status. This is status uh, equals yellow. I think this will work. Uh, so we can then probably just do else if here uh, working span dot sequence equal to uh, red span uh, response dot status equals health dot red uh, and then we can do uh, else we should do an else if really here because we, so we don't want to do it in any scenario we just want to do it if uh, sequence equal to what's left green response dot status this is then this seems like a lot of work and it is um, to, to you know piles and enum we'd probably have to do some some clever stuff for real but if you imagine that at the moment I'm, I'm hand coding this stuff for my own kind of prototype in in the real world I'm thinking if this is something that we could auto generate from a spec file so if we know what the structure of the JSON is as in you know property number one is called X and it returns a string property number two is you know so on and so forth um, we could we could cogen this kind of stuff this is hand rolled for now but we could cogen it um, so we're saying that I think that looks reasonable uh, for now and I'm tempted to save that there and let's just put a breakpoint on here and debug my test um, and then we'll be able to see where did that window go okay uh, have I got that right that's my first question uh, so we're we expecting property name oh we got end object okay yeah we haven't dealt with that case yet so we're gonna have to probably go a little further with this um, how do we want to do that? Let's just do it in this in here for now. So let's just say case. Uh, now looking at my notes, I said case thirty-one should be the end of this thing. 
Uh, so we're going to say in here is if uh, reader dot token reader dot token type uh, is not equal to a JSON token dot end object, then we'll, we'll we'll throw our thing. We'll throw our error here. Um, otherwise, we should go through. So we then also need to say else if token counter. I suppose we could have done this. Maybe we'll just do this here actually. If token counter is 31, we'll chuck that to this statement up here. And then we don't need that there. That makes sense. So we'll come into this if first. Uh, so let's see if we can now run the test. I'm not expecting this to fully pass, but what I'm expecting is to have at least the cluster name and hopefully uh, the enum on here. So the cluster health response, we have one, has a name, that's good. And it has the correct color, which is even better. Um, I'm pretty pleased with that. Uh, Stuart, I have a work meeting. I'll catch you when I can. Great stuff to see you next time. Thanks, Stuart. Um, enjoy the work meeting. Uh, work meetings at 5 p.m. and not, not fair. Um, cool. So I think we're kind of getting there, actually, because the rest of this is just going to be a little bit of boring mapping between uh, all of the values. Uh, I'll get my notepad up here. Um, so we've dealt with these two. We know this one then should be a bool value, then we'll be into integers. Um, I think this is a long, I'll check that in the actual type in a moment, and then that's a double. So uh, it gets a little, we can just kind of copy paste our way to, to, to victory, hopefully, uh, shortly. Um, so let's get out of here and let's say K6. Um, So at the moment, what we're doing is we're asserting, so I, I could do basically this again, but I'm gonna, um, this might be a bit repetitive, but let's, let's, let's go with it for now. So if this is a, a number, uh, we should be able to do get int 32. Uh, we can't assign that to cluster name, obviously, and the value this is going into, oh no, it's a bool next anyway. Uh, so let's, let's deal with the right, the right thing at a time, uh, dot, Okay, so it has a token type of false, and there should be one for true, of course. So if um, if it's not equal to false, or uh, the reader isn't the reader token type um, is not equal to uh, true. So if it's neither of the the expected values, then that's an exception. Otherwise, uh, dot get how do we get a ball out of this? Get boolean, um, and then assign that to um, what's it called? Status. No, status is what we've just dealt with, and it timed out. Okay, so that hopefully works. So it's reads the next JSON token from the source as a ball. Seems reasonable. Case six done. Uh, case eight. So we're going to have a few of these, but now, as I say, we should be onto the numbers, shouldn't we? So, having done this a few times now, I'm actually starting to think this is something I'm going to want to avoid. So, I'm going to put in a method here. Um, where am I? I'm lost inside my. Down here, outside of the, my. Outside of this method. Uh, let's have a private void assert number. Which is going to take in a JSON token. No, I suppose it could. Uh, JSON token. Is this the right uh, namespace? Let's just not. Newton's of JSON token. Token type. That's where, the, where we want it, isn't it? System text JSON token type. So that's going to take in the type. Um, and then on here, we'll put the same logic we've been doing because we're going to do this lots for numbers. I don't really want to put this all into my my switch if I can avoid it. So if um, the token type is not equal to number, then it's going to be an exception. And that's probably going to work for the rest of these. This can be static. Let's say state in that. And so then we could do a certain number, reader dot token. Reader dot token type pass in there, so that checks it's not uh, whether it is or isn't a number. And then assuming we get through that check, um, don't need an if anymore. 
now we just need to assign this. And the first one is number of nodes. Actually, let me just double check which ones of these are. So this is int, int. So active shards as percent is a double. Uh, percent as numbers, so that's that one. I'm just gonna make a note on my file here. That's the double. Uh, int, 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 int. Long for the task wait time. And int for everything else, cool. Okay, so this would be an integer. So what we're gonna do is on our response dot uh, number of nodes, um, that can then be set with reader dot get in 32. Cool. Uh, all right, a couple of questions. Uh, Blazer, Mr. Magoo, don't you want and and there? Um, now I've probably moved on from when you commented, where are we looking? Oh, okay. Yeah, case exception. Yeah, you're very right. Um, so what it's saying is, yeah, if the token type is not false and the token type is not true, then it's an error. That feels sensible. Um, good catch, thank you. Um, and Nick uh, Maris, Maris Mazigo, oh, I'm terrible with pronunciation. Uh, is C sharp similar to C plus uh, plus? Yeah, uh, they're of the same family. I haven't done C plus plus myself. Um, they're of the same family, so syntactically, um, you know, I think you know the, the curly braces, things like that, should be a bit familiar. Um, the rubber are obviously going to be different. So C sharp is is adding more and more features to kind of try and make it quite productive. So. Um, things that I don't know if C++ has personally, but uh, um, yeah, from a from a very high level point of view, they're similar in sort of structure, um, but then they're gonna obviously have differences as you, as you drip down. C sharp would normally be considered, I guess, probably easier to learn than C++, in the old days at least. Um, C++ might have moved on a fair bit since then. Uh, so we've done case eight, which is number, so I'm just gonna be repeating these now. Um, so we're getting close, I think, so that's, that's we're getting a bit over time, but let's keep going. Um, let's just, we need all of the cases now, all of the even number cases up to, uh, what did I say we were ending on? So 31 is the end, so I guess 30. Um, should be our last one. Uh, 14, 16, and then what we just need to do is point these at the right properties um, on each of the, Uh, 24, 26, 28, 30. Um, and there's probably some really nice uh, like tools or ways people do this kind of code editing, but I'm just gonna do it by hand. So uh, let me look at my file again. So this is token uh, zero. So this is, from a point of view of the value, this is two, four, six, six, eight, ten. 10. I think this will be easier for me to reference <laughs> just to make sure I'm Actually putting things in the right place, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30. So we just need to basically line these up now. So where did we, 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 we did? Eight was our first one. So um, how have I got case nine? Ignore, ignore that. I mean, it should be even numbers only. Case nine, case 10 uh, goes to number of data nodes. Uh, 12 goes to active primary shards, uh, active shards. So this is all information you can get about your, if you're running Elasticsearch and you, you've basically got a, a cluster um, of one or more nodes. Um, and this is the kind of summary information that you can call to kind of see what's, what's the health of my cluster, as in how many nodes do I have, how many are sort of waiting to be allocated uh, or to start up properly and that kind of stuff. So. Um, not easy to talk while you do this. 18 is initializing, so this would be, you know, are there any shards within my cluster that are still initializing or trying to initialize? Um, 20 is unassigned shards. Um, you don't need to, you know, worry about the details of what these go to, I guess, for now. Um, this is just one random response that I've picked um, uh, from, from the library, pending tasks, um, so that we can try things out. 26, number in flight, fetch. Okay, 28, now this is where we enter the world of um, a long, which is get int uh, 64, I guess, yeah. Uh, which goes to waiting, 
there. And then the final one is active shards percentage as a number, which uh, is a double, is there a double? Get double, cool. So we've in theory covered all the cases here. Yeah, it's probably arguably correct that we could actually just cover the whole thing to a switch. Uh, I mean, from, a, from an execution time point of view, my concern over this code in terms of there's a lot of branching. Um, I don't know how that's going to affect the, uh, the execution time of this stuff. Okay, um, it feels like that should work. So let's, let's just run the test and see if we get green. I, I suspect I've messed something up in here. Okay, uh, that was that was positive. Um, rest assured, most of my code does not go green that quickly. Um, okay, well, this is why I've written the test because I wanted to. I didn't. I knew I wouldn't trust myself um, that the code would work. Um, so that that works. So if we we should be able to use this, and actually we've already got our benchmark. So we're creating this this reader. We're passing it the stream, which we've set to position zero is just kind of a, uh, an effect of running these as benchmarks. And then uh, we're assigning the cluster health response from the read method, which is given the test pass, feels like it should work. Um, so let's benchmark this. Do we want to run all of these? It's going to take a bit of time. Um, I'm going to get rid of Newtonsoft JSON for now because I know we knew that that had like, well, let's have a look at these re earlier results. I mean, results between runs, we can't compare these you know, 100%, but I'm just going to copy this over because there's all sorts of things on this machine that's going to affect these benchmarks um, um, and stuff. So, yeah. So previously that one took, well, it took you know, 6.5 microseconds and allocated 6K odd of, of stuff. We'll compare to these two because these, the, you know, these are clearly the front runners in terms of they're pretty good already. Um, so that's what I'm going to compare against now. Um, so let's just make sure I've saved everything. Um, that should run. So let's just run my benchmarks. Um, and this is where benchmark.net is going to kick in. So we're running it in release mode, which benchmark.net requires. Benchmarks are going to kick in um, and it's just going to run many thousands, even tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of iterations of these blocks of benchmarking codes that we, we, we've marked for it and then give us the results, give us the, the mean of those results. The reason it's going to do so many as a sort of reminder is that, um, you know, if we did the low level way of doing this, if you weren't using benchmarks, maybe, maybe you stick a stopwatch around the code um, and that will give you a very rough idea. But obviously there's a few issues. The precision of the, t the, the, the stopwatch is not necessarily going to be good enough to get down to these micro session, microsecond measurements. Um, similarly, uh, each, if you do just do one run of something, you know, if my virus kind of kicked in, that could suddenly swamp my CPU, and so the test could run twice as slow for that particular test. Um, and so this is why it's doing. You can see here, uh, well, uh, what's that? In the region of two hundred, yeah, six. Uh, sorry, two hundred and sixty-two thousand odd operations um, for each run. Um, so that's obviously a lot. Um, and you can see, obviously, the the op the time of these is is coming through for each each um, block of runs. So it's doing these a lot um, and it's doing multiple iterations of those tests to give us a good average. So we're gonna let that run. I'm gonna see what's going on in the chat. So uh, from Nick, oh, so yeah, from Nick. Uh, okay, I'll hang around then. I've studied C++ uh, by uh, my own for an exam. I think uh, something that could help me. So that I hope it does. Um, good luck for the exam as well. Um, and then we've got Taibo, uh, Taibo G player. Hi, sir. Uh, what you coding? So um, yeah, what we're coding is uh, what we what we're running now is some benchmarks against some C sharp code. Um, what we're looking at in that C sharp code is can we optimize deserialization of uh, JSON? So we have a, a stream of JSON bytes coming in from some source. Um, in this case, we've just kind of hard coded them for the test, but this would realistically be coming over uh, from a HTTP request. Um, and then what we're looking to do is see can we can we take that stream of bytes and, and turn it into a C sharp object that represents a you know a strongly typed object that represents the response, um, and then um, how how efficiently can we do that really? Um, which is why we're running these tests now. So while those are running, because that is going to take a moment, I'm going to drag this over here so I can keep an eye on it. But uh, let's just recap 
uh, for people that's, that join the stream late. So uh, benchmark uh, .NET is the library we're using. So this is a, uh, if I open up the project file. So this is a .NET 5 project file um, and it's got a reference to this benchmark.net library. We've also brought in two serializers or uh, serialization libraries that we want to compare. And then inside our program, we are establishing a class that represents what, all of our benchmarks. We're giving it some sort of setup data. So this is the string representation of the JSON that when this uh, when this benchmarking process starts up in setup, we convert to stream of bytes, so just a memory stream for now. And then we have individual uh, methods that test each of the different serializers. So UTF-8, system text, and our custom, our new one. Uh, and then this is our new one that we've just written. Um, I'm guessing that's going to say that could be read only. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to listen to the, this is where like compilers and things like, um, you know, uh, resharper and stuff just make your code better without you having to think too much. So, uh, okay, we're finished over here. So let's bring this over. So for those that are bearing with me, um, well, actually I'm pretty pleased with that. Um, so here's, well, these are kind of our two kind of starting points of what we're trying to achieve. So we are faster than the, the built-in system text JSON sort of higher level reader, which kind of makes sense because they're having, they don't know enough about structure or JSON to take some of the cheats and the optimizations that our code does. So um, they're having to read each token and they're going to have to then compare to see is, is the type that they're trying to build, does it have those? Um, and, then, and there may even be some reflection and stuff going on. So a little quicker. Um, and yeah, this is kind of good. Uh, so we're down on, on allocated bytes. We're 136. So we shaved off 40 more bytes, which, you know, for a one-off item is not great, uh, or is, is not massive, I should say. It's, it's pretty good in the context, I think. But um, if you imagine that this is happening, you know, in client applications that are using Elasticsearch heavily and they're, they're using it from a .NET perspective to index stuff or, um, you know, we've done a health response here, which you're probably not going to do all that often, but you're going to hit the indexing APIs and search APIs very often, potentially. And if you're doing that, um, if we have an allocation cost to give you your strongly typed representation of that response back, um, you know, we want to get that down. And, and so that's why, you know, the, the code today kind of uses this versus Newton stuff JSON, um, because we do have a lot less allocations. Remember it was 6K. Um, so we've gone from 6K with Newton soft JSON. We've got it down using built-in um, or, or third-party libraries and then the Microsoft built-in one. Uh, and then we've now improved that further by kind of customizing it. So. Um, it, this is pretty much as far as I'm going to go. Uh, the, the, the obvious thing is we're a bit slower than UTF-8 JSON. Uh, not significantly. I mean, we're talking point three. well, not even point three, point two and a bit of a, of a microsecond. It's pretty, pretty small numbers in the scheme of things. Um, I'm not too worried about closing that gap too much, but I suspect it's the branching. Um, so maybe we can do something with that. Um, is this as good as we can get? I don't know. I'm hoping it is. In theory, the code is not allocating anything it shouldn't. Um, I need to wrap up the stream, but I'm going to do some quick and dirty hacks. I'm just um, uh, so just check if I've not missed anything in the chat. No, cool. Um, what we could do is we could use a profiler on this. Um, just to just to see what the allocations actually are, because I don't know if I can close that gap. If if I, 136 bytes feels pretty good, um, but let's let's see. So I'm going to profile the code. This is a really ugly way of profiling code, but I'm going to just do it by hand. I think so. Um, my my var. Uh, what, 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 I'm going to call this thing. Uh, bar thing, it doesn't really matter, is a new um, instance of this. Yeah, it's important. So it's a new instance of that. No, what am I, what am I doing? All right, so I'm confusing myself. So I need an instance of the thing I'm gonna use. I need to call uh, thing.setup, which calls the, uh, the setup for our stream. 
Um, then, so the, the problem with this, I, I, I'm going to just do a very quick low, low tech profile on this, but um, there's a few things that are happening in here that we have to take into account. So I spoke earlier about this array pool. So the, if we just ran a, a single profile on this, then we might actually see the allocation of the first uh, byte array of this length that goes into this pool. There may not be anything else that's used anything from the array pool. And I don't want to measure that in my profiling. So I'm essentially going to do a low tech version of what benchmark.net does. And I'm just going to, I think, do a, uh, just do a for loop here uh, for 100 iterations. Um, and in here, we'll just call thing dot. Um, and I'll just do my custom, that one. So this is essentially like warm up, uh, just to make sure that the array pool has some stuff in it. Um, so we're testing this a bit fairly. And then I'm going to do a, I've done this before. Um, it's really, it's really disgusting, but uh, basically, I'm just going to um, pause here so that I can, when I'm profiling this, I can kind of get an idea. I can separate my allocations a little bit from one another. I'm going to then call that after the person or me presses the key, and then we'll wait again so we don't collect any other um, allocations that might happen when this app shuts down. So this is, you know, it's a bit ugly. You can you can do this in nicer ways. There's a there's a whole API for for JetBains where you can kind of can do this. But I'm just going to use the built-in stuff. So we should run with a hundred times. We're going to call our method just to warm up the array pool and give us a fair starting point. We'll pause briefly, which I can control. Then I'm just going to let this run once and pause again. And then I'll let the app stop and I'm going to profile this um, with the performance profiler. I want to be doing this in release mode. Uh, okay, so yeah, this is the one we want. Done it. Object allocation tracking. Track every object that gets allocated. Perfect. Uh, and I should be able to start. So this is going to run my project. And once we're done here, I think that's a good point for the day. So over here is my app running. So you can see at the moment it's ticking along. There's nothing allocating. So if I press the Enter key, so if it might be really tiny on the screen. There's a tiny green blob there, which means we've got some allocations, and I'm going to let the app stop. Um, so then that's going to finish the diagnostic session, which is just going to wrap up all of the results for us. It takes a minute. Um, so this at the moment shows us all the allocations that have happened in the app since it began. I just want this block, I think. And we have one string, one cluster health response, I'm going to guess, um, and four S byte arrays. Interesting. Um, so I don't know what that's from from the moment, but this is kind of what I was expecting. So we've got one in, uh, one instance of our object that we're actually trying to deserialize into. We have one instance of a string, which comes from that um, status, not status, uh, cluster name is a string. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. We'll track this down in a moment. Um, so first off, let's have a look. So this object, uh, there's one allocation of it. We can you can drill in here, so you can kind of do all sorts of fancy stuff. Um, but you can drill into here, and you can see the cool stack basically. So from the main method, we entered our custom reader benchmark, and then there was the, our, our response reader thing was read method was called, and at that point, this object got allocated. Um, we're not seeing the native code because we don't care about that here. And this is I messed up the titles, but that should be bytes. Um, don't know what's happened to this window. Yeah, there's a bug in Visual Studio, I think. This is bytes, so 88 bytes for the object itself. The string is 44, which is um, 12 character ones, 13, 132 bytes. And what did we say we had? 136 bytes. So we've, we've lost four bytes, but we are almost at the point where I don't think we can get any lower. And is the four bytes this thing? No, that's 208 bytes. So where's this coming from? Is that in native code? If I come in, I should maybe be better getting it from here. Uh, so there's the four. We got to cover by. Ah, okay. So we're picking up the read key. Um, so yeah, when that read key um, method it's called uh, in our kind of low tech profiling code. So this is, I can ignore this. So what I don't know is where the other four bytes have gone. 
if we ignore that, we've got 88, we've got 44, we've got 132, and there's four bytes missing, which might be something I'm missing in my head. Um, but given that we've not captured the allocations here, I'm not really sure. For now, I'm not going to worry about four bytes. Uh, it will bug me after I stop the stream, I'm sure, but I'm, I'm kind of happy with that. So that's what essentially I think we can wrap up on today is that um, the question we were trying to answer, or the question I was trying to answer before I started this whole thing was, if we went down the route of generating and or writing, whatever, um, custom readers based on the specific shape of the JSON that we know we're getting, could we get more optimal than using some of the already quite optimal um, sort of low allocation libraries like UTF-8 JSON or system text JSON. Um, and looking at these results, then we can say, well, if we're looking at reducing allocations, yes, we can. Uh, execution time, you know, maybe we can close this gap. Maybe, uh, yeah, I may, I'm not sure I could be bothered for the amount of time that it's gonna give us. Um, but I suppose as a kind of an intellectual exercise, if I can get another stream in, in the near future, we could we could look at this code here and we can see if we can optimize this. So, you know, if we can avoid some branching um, and all of these conditional checks, um, I mean, probably an immediate cheat we could do is, is just as an experiment, um, just get rid of these checks. Um, I'm not going to get rid of them all because it takes you long. But if I if I get rid of these checks, and let's just let's make the assumption, so a certain number is doing nothing. Actually, maybe we can get rid of them all. Um, so again, you know, the 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 assumption uh, the assumption we're making is that the, the structure of the JSON is not going to change, which is potentially a safe assumption in this scenario because we 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 know what's happening on the other end of this stuff. Um, and that's the difference because we know the types that we want to create and we know the responses we're getting and we're not just dealing with, you know, this is arbitrary data. We can be a little bit more strict about it. So I'm going to get rid of those ifs for now. And then I'm just going to set my benchmarks to just run. And this will be, this will be the last thing now uh, to go just to see. Um, yeah, so just run our custom benchmark because I'm going to, going to guess that those additional checks are probably adding to the cost. And then we could argue, you know, from a code point of view, whether we should have them, whether we do or don't need them. For example, you know, we're, we're doing a check. These we might need, these are a bit more significant. We want to check we actually actually have a JSON object coming in, but do we need to check whether the first, the, you know, the tokens we expect to be property names are or not? We're not using them, so maybe not. Um, it would throw a, it would, you know, it would cause a problem in our deserialization um, if it was different to what we were expecting. Um, and things like this get string. Does does this under the hood? And I can dig into the code from Microsoft. But does this under the hood already do this kind of stuff? I suspect maybe it does. Um, so maybe we're duplicating effort here. And you know, if it can't get a string because the token isn't a string, it will probably throw this already. Um, now that I think about it, so let's go with this assumption i mean if i would let's see what the results are i mean if i was going to test this again i suppose there's actually a method invocation here that we can totally do away with um, and that's probably getting in, inlined already but uh, we could rerun this in a second without these asserts here and that may even speed us up and that will be the last last thing uh, that i do so it's still running do i do i let this finish or do I just see if I can improve things? Uh, let's not wait. Let's, let's run this one more time with that change that I've just made. Um, cool. Um, if there's anyone left on the stream, I know everyone's probably jumped over to see um, Biden. Um, if there's anyone left on the stream, if you have any questions, comments, theories, ideas, whatever, um, let me have them. I kind of want to... Uh, you know, I want to share this stuff as much as I can because I think it might be interesting to people. Um, but I'm hoping to learn off other people as well. And you know, we already had an example earlier on with um, Blazer, Mr. Magoo. You know, caught caught a mistake in my code. Um, and then my test would have got it eventually, but um, uh, you know, that's that saved me a few minutes. So I'm, I'm you know, already getting something out of this. I'm just going to let this run. Um, we'll see the results, and then we'll check all of this stuff in. And then, um, as I say. 
from a point of view of proving what I wanted to prove, it has. Um, you know, we'd have to think about how we co-generated that stuff, but it proves that there probably is some value in it, particularly for the bigger, bigger types. Um, I don't think there's a great deal we can shave off. I don't know where those four bytes are going. Um, they're not they're not getting picked up by the profiler. So there just might be something a little odd uh, in Newton soft, uh, sorry, in benchmark.net. Um, I can't think what it would be. It's, it's normally pretty consistent um, from my tests in the past. It's always lined up pretty much with the profiler. Uh, cool, okay, so those are the results. Uh, now I didn't run the comparison, so you have to remember where we got to here. So uh, 2.36, and again, this isn't totally fair. We should try and run these benchmarks consistently. Um, but where's the results we had from the prior run? Here we are. Okay, so we may, by removing those ifs, um, have got you know another 0.1 of a millisecond a microsecond, I should say, um, back. So we're a little closer to this. this is, so we'll call that 2.2. Um, and oops, that's not the window I want. Um, call that 2.2. And we're down, we're at 2.35. It's not really fair to round that. Um, so we're, yeah, we're a little off, but we're not far off. And we've, we've still got the bytes missing. Cool. I'm going to call that a day there everyone so let's have a just check uh what have we done we've modified program we've modified our benchmark test we haven't really changed anything else so i'm going to add all of this stuff what's not didn't think i'd change that uh, significantly but let's add it that way um and i'm just going to commit this as uh added custom reader and tested. Well, I just added custom reader. Um, that's all we've really done there. Um, yeah, that looks good. We'll push this up to uh, the repo. So this is on my um, my GitHub. Uh, where's the, the GitHub page? Uh, GitHub um, slash Steve J. Gordon. Uh, repositories. Um, Jason benchmarks. There it is. So this is yeah. We just pushed up to this. So this, if you want to check this out, um, I'll check this in this on the chat as well. That's where we're at at the moment. Um, pretty happy with that. Um, hopefully, uh, it's been useful to anyone that's been uh, been with me this evening. I'm going to call it there. My stomach is telling me I'm hungry. Um, I want to get some food. Um, I'm going to you know, try and continue these live streams. That's kind of my objective. I've done two to make sure I'm not totally scared of doing them. Um, learning lots as I go uh, about getting the setup right. Um, so what I'd like to do, uh, well, what I'm thinking of doing is a couple of things. So when I have stuff like this, where you don't have to understand the whole of Elasticsearch and Elasticsearch.net to kind of follow along, um, I think any work that I'm doing like that, I might just ad hoc do streams. Um, because uh, I think that will be, you know, maybe useful. And then the other thing I'd like to do is a more regular stream, which I'm going to start thinking about, you know, when I can fit it into my schedule, um, where maybe we actually start using um, Elasticsearch.net to build some things. So I'm thinking, you know, we'll have a we'll have a ASP.NET Core website. We'll use, you know, Elasticsearch behind the scenes to support, you know, searching requirements within that application, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, if that's stuff you'd be interested in, let me know. Um, or if you'd like to see other stuff, let me know. Um, I'm at Steve J. Gordon on Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, happy to kind of get your feedback there or in the chat uh, when, when we're online. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll set up a future stream at some point, I'm sure. Um, thank you for joining me again this evening and I will see you next time.